I invite you to join me in Acts, the second chapter. Acts, the second chapter. Say, well, that's a funny place to preach from on Resurrection Sunday. No, it's not. You'll see. <laughs> Acts, the second chapter, beginning at verse 22. We're going to read today through verse 36. This is the second part of the message that the Apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost immediately following the outpouring and the arrival of the Holy Ghost on the 120 or so who had gathered in the upper room Peter preached on that day, and this is the second half or so of his message that day. Listen, Acts 2, 22 through 36. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before <coughs> spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord saith unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly 
that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Hallelujah. I want to talk to us today for a while on the topic, it couldn't be done. Hallelujah. It couldn't be done. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, we thank you, God, for the wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost in the house of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful hymns and songs of the church, old and new. They remind us of so many great truths, oh God, today. Oh, my Lord, how we celebrate the resurrection of our King, our Redeemer, our Savior, our God today. Master, pour out the Holy Ghost as the Word of God goes forth. Let the hearer today be overwhelmed and overcome by the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. There is no greater day in the Christian faith than today. There is no greater moment in the history of the world that is to be celebrated with greater enthusiasm and excitement than this moment in history when the man Jesus Christ, full of the divinity and the power and the glory of Almighty God, for the Word of God declares that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. Even that Christ took back his life. Hallelujah. Took it back. Took it into his own hands. Rose up from that deathbed. Folded his grave clothes. He was in no hurry to leave. Laid them at the foot of the place where he had lain. And emerged from the tomb victorious over hell, death, and the grave. The Roman soldiers overcome by the power of God manifested at that moment in that tomb, falling to the ground as though they were dead. As that big stone rolled aside, Hallelujah. To allow the King of Glory to exit. Master, in the name of Jesus, anoint the messenger today. Help me, Lord. Oh, what, what more important a message can we preach than He lives? He lives, He lives. Anoint the ear of every hearer. Let our hearts today be prepared to not only hear, but to receive this word from heaven. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Glory to God. Amen. Praise God and amen. I've got to tell you, folks, there is no day in the Christian calendar that is more exciting to me. There is no day in, in Christianity that is more thrilling for me than the day that we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God promises that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart, not just say it, but believe it in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you, this last few days I've been going into different businesses and stuff. I had to go into a Metro PCS store last night, and the young lady was listening to some gospel, uh, well, Christian, I guess you'd call it music. I can't say it was anything I was all that keen on, but anyway. And uh, she said something to the effect of, Happy Easter as I was leaving. And I looked at her and I said, well, I, said, I don't use the word Easter because Easter is a pagan holiday that predates Christianity. But I will say this, he is risen. Hallelujah. And even as I spoke those words to her, tears started to come down my face because I can't say that except I believe it. Hallelujah. I believe it in my heart. And when I make that declaration, I feel it. Hallelujah. I feel it in my spirit. 
Oh, it couldn't be done. How many times we watch television, we watch movies, how many times in real life have we experienced tragedies, horrible accidents, medical emergencies, someone we love is lying on a gurney in the hospital, they've been carried into an operating room or they're in a trauma center and we are praying and hoping for their survival. We see this in the movies all the time. We see this on television. Many of us at some point in our lives have had to live this reality for ourselves. And there you see people praying and hoping for the life of that individual on the table to be spared. Then finally, after a period of time, the doctor comes out and with a somber look on his face, he comes over to the wife, the husband, the mother, the dad, the loved one, and says, I'm sorry, there was nothing we could do. There was nothing more we could do. We did everything that we could. There are no more tragic words that we must hear than, it was beyond our ability. It was beyond our power. It was beyond our control. There was nothing more that we could do. That means that it was hopeless. That means that for the doctors and the professionals in the medical profession who were tending to that individual who was dying, that it was beyond their ability to preserve that life and to keep that individual alive. It's tragic words. And on the day of Pentecost, as the Holy Ghost came down upon the 120 or so who had gathered together in the upper room, honoring the Lord's command that they should tarry in the city of Jerusalem until the promise of the Father come upon them. That day as Peter began to preach following the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, Peter made the declaration to those of Jerusalem who had gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. He made the declaration concerning the man Jesus. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. What is Peter saying? He's saying, first of all, y'all did this, but you didn't do it without God knowing it to be done. It, you didn't do it without God's permission. Hallelujah. God had all this plan. So while you did this by wicked hands, you did this with all the wicked motivation in the world. The truth of the matter is, this was all foreordained by God. You hear what I'm telling you? Oh, I want to tell you, even the most evil, wicked action sometimes taken by men is all part of God's plan. He knows what he's doing. He said, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Listen, verse 24, Acts chapter 2. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Listen to this next phrase. Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. It couldn't be done. Hallelujah. The title of my message today, it couldn't be done. Death could not hold him. It couldn't be done. It was not possible. It is not a matter of uh, this is just simply part of God's plan and this is how God designed it to be. It went so far beyond simply being part of God's plan. The Apostle Peter makes the declaration it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Death couldn't possibly hold Jesus. It just wasn't even a reality. It wasn't a possibility. It was not something that could even be imagined uh, that could possibly 
happen and remain as it was. He said, no, it was not possible. Well, we have doctors coming in and telling us, I'm sorry, it was not possible for us to, to save your loved one. <laughs> in the case of Jesus, we have the opposite. Hallelujah. We have the apostle Peter come out and say, it is not possible that he should remain dead. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Why would it not be possible? Why is it that it was not possible? Possible? Why is it that it couldn't be done that Christ should remain in the grave dead forever as all men otherwise die? It has to do, my friend, not with his abilities. It does not have to do with his relationship to the divine. It has to do with his identity. Hallelujah. Amen. When you know who this man Jesus was, then you understand that it was not possible that death should hold him. In Luke chapter 24, verses 45 through 53, the word of the Lord reads, Then opened he, meaning Jesus, there, meaning the apostles, understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Now listen to this next phrase. And they worshipped him. <laughs> and they worshipped him. And they eat Oh, people wonder why is it that Jesus is the focus of the New Testament church? Why are all these churches running around talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus? Why aren't they giving credit to the Father Jehovah? Why aren't they talking about Jehovah? Because as the Lord ascended, they're alone. Mm -hmm. Never one time in the lifetime of the man Jesus did he deny worship. Not one time when someone came and the word of God said and they worshiped him. Never one time did he say oh no 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 don't worship me. Worship God alone. Not one time. Oh but the lame man at the gate of the temple that's called beautiful when Peter and John declared to him, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. When the people saw this miracle and they began to fall to their knees to worship Peter and John, what did Peter and John say? Oh, no, 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 don't you do that. Don't you do that. 
Oh, but I'm here to tell you today, listen to me, children. Oh, when your mind has been opened by the Holy Ghost, when you suddenly have understanding of the Scriptures, what are the Scriptures? The Old Testament canon. When you understand the Old Testament canon, then all of a sudden you understand who Jesus is. And when you understand who Jesus is, you understand why it couldn't be done. Hallelujah. You understand why it was it's not possible that he could remain dead. Glory to God. Now it's not about what he could do. It's about who he was. Hallelujah. In his sermon on the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter referred to everything I just read to you. He referred to everything that I have just read to you from Luke chapter 24. How that the Lord after his resurrection told the apostles and the believers to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until the promise of the Father come upon them. But as the Lord ascended, they worshipped him. Hallelujah. Finally, there was wholesale understanding. Finally, it wasn't just John who had a glimpse of the divinity of Christ. You see, throughout his entire ministry, John had it. John saw it. John could see it. John probably had a much better understanding of the Old Testament prophets than the other apostles did. Because the word of God says John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. The Lord had a special connection to John. And I believe with all my heart that connection was born of the fact that John could see through the Lord's humanity and understand, oh my goodness, <laughs> there's something special here. Glory to God. There is something divine here. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Hallelujah. Oh, he was in the world, John wrote in John chapter 1. And he, he, he created the world, and the world knew him not. Glory to God. Not they, he created the world. He created the world. If Jesus and the Father are separate people, got news for you. John gave credit for the creation to the Son and not to the Father. But the Father, Jehovah God declares in the Old Testament, I created the world. I set the limits for the seas and the ocean. I set the mountains in their place. Therefore, my friend, it can only be one truth here. Jesus is God. Hallelujah. They worshipped him as he ascended. Why? Because of who he was. It was that same identity that would not permit him to stay dead. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. It was that same identity that prevented him from being able to remain in the grave. And it's funny because the apostle Peter refers to the prophecy in the Old Testament uh, written by David, the psalmist, the king, that speaks of the Lord raising up Christ and raising up a man who would, in fact, sit upon the throne of David. And you'll notice that uh, uh, Peter even uses the language, after the flesh. He's saying only, only in terms of the flesh. He only raised the man up in terms of the flesh. He only raised the man up to sit in the throne of David only after the flesh in terms of the flesh. That did not have nothing to do with what was going on on the inside. <sighs> David said, the Lord hath sworn in truth unto his servant David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy loins shall I sit in thy throne. Hallelujah. That's Old Testament scripture. All of a sudden, that's what the apostles got. All of a sudden, that's what the disciples of Christ understood. All of a sudden, that came to life in their spirit as they watched this man who had walked among them for 33 and a half years rise up. 
without benefit of any device or mechanism rise up into the sky to be received in the clouds only to be followed by the appearance of angelic men who promise that this thing Jesus, hallelujah, that you see Lehman is coming back. Oh, glory to God. And they worship him because they finally got it. Oh, hallelujah. Isaiah 9 and 6, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. They finally got it. They finally understood. And this is what would not permit the Lord to remain beyond three days in the grave. But see, God is no fool. Three days in a grave and any human body will have well begun to decay. Three days in the grave and any body would well have uh, begun to disintegrate and stink and be a mess. But God designed his plan in such a way so that when it was all said and done, there could be no mistake that he had risen again. Hallelujah. And you know what, Tommy? Got news for Jehovah's Witnesses. It is a lie from the pit of hell that his body evaporated and he was given a new body. That is a lie from the pit of hell because the Word of God says that he was not his body, his flesh would not see corruption. Why would God preserve the body if there was no plan to reuse it? Hallelujah. No, no, no. God said, <laughs> I'm going to keep that body good because I plan on getting right back in again after three days. Hallelujah. So there were two miracles involved here. There was the miracle of preservation and there was the miracle of resurrection. I'm going to tell you something. I've been telling people for a lot of years. There are a lot of people who pray and ask God for miracles, for healing, for deliverance, for various issues, and they get upset when they don't get their miracle, when it doesn't doesn't come through the way they'd like to see it. And I look at them sometimes and I say, you know what, in 1993 I had a doctor tell me I had a terminal illness and that I'd be gone within a year, I'd be dead within a year. It is now 2023, look at me. Did he ever heal me of that? No. Nope. Still got it, but you know what, I'm still here. <laughs> There's a miracle of preservation and there's a miracle of resurrection. I want to tell you something, honey. God can leave the cancer in your body and still, still, still keep you living and breathing and walking and talking and doing. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. It's still a miracle. Yes. It still defies science. Mm -hmm. It still causes the doctors and the scientists to wonder in amazement because they cannot understand what's going on with you. I've had doctors come on a number of occasions, not just once or twice, on a few occasions. I've had doctors come and talk to me and say, I don't understand how you're even alive. It's called the miracle of preservation. Hallelujah. Sometimes the Lord will raise you up from the dead. Sometimes he'll give you the big miracle. But you know what? Until you get to the big miracle, oftentimes he'll give you the preservation miracle. Hallelujah. It's still a miracle. It's still a big miracle. But you know what cracks me up is how many Christians overlook the preservation because they're not going to be happy until they see the resurrection. But what has God done for you that has caused you not to see corruption? What has God done for you to cause you not to see obliteration? What has God done for you to cause your life to be preserved in the meantime? Think about it, saints. Oh, I'm telling you, I thank God for the miracle of preservation. Hallelujah. Yes. I know resurrection's coming. Hallelujah. One day that big miracle will come. But in the meantime, he keeps me and keeps me and keeps me. And the doctors keep saying, I don't understand it. I don't get it. It didn't make sense to me. John chapter 5, verses 36 to 39. 
The Lord Jesus Christ writes, uh, writes uh, says, But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Now listen to what Jesus says. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. We've got entire religious movements that have a fit because the entire Old Testament, they say, is focused on Jehovah God and the entire New Testament is focused on Jesus and that is a travesty that is something that ought not to be because after all that doesn't make any sense the God of the Old Testament is Jehovah then all of a sudden in the New Testament the church goes off on a whole new path and they're worshiping Jesus and saying about Jesus and preaching about Jesus and talking about Jesus what's wrong with that Ain't nothing wrong with him, fool. There's something wrong with you. The Lord said, search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. You don't read the name Jesus one time in the Old Testament. You don't see the name Yeshua except in, in, in Joshua because Joshua is the Old Testament uh, the Hebrew name for Jesus. Jesus is a Greek version of the Hebrew Yeshua. You don't read about God. You don't read about uh, uh, Jesus in the Old Testament. Oh yes you do. If you know what you're reading you do. <laughs> every passage every passage that says Lord Every passage where you see the word Lord inserted, the word Lord is used for uh, the, the, the uh, term that is used in modern English, Jehovah. Jehovah is not an accurate name. It is not an accurate translation. All legitimate uh, scholars, Hebrew scholars, Greek scholars know that for a fact. We know that Jehovah is something that is man-made. It's, it's basically a best guess for the Old Testament name of God, which the Jews would not use. And that is why it literally went into obscurity and nobody knows what exactly that name was. <sighs> But a Roman Catholic uh, monk came along centuries later and he said, well, if I take these vowels and if I insert them in these consonants that are used for the name of God, we come up with Jehovah. But anybody who knows Hebrew looks at the word Jehovah and says, that don't make sense. That's not, that is not how the vowels would fall. That it doesn't make a legitimate name. Well, we've got entire movements that are telling us that God's name is Jehovah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you don't know that, there's something wrong with you. No, there's something wrong with you, my friend, because the truth of the matter is, whatever that name is, the Lord God Almighty, if you want to call it Jehovah, call it Jehovah, Yahweh, Adonai, declared over and over again, his name, and he said, I am Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. You know, Je uh, uh, he, uh, Jehovah Jireh, God your provider. Jesus, the word Jesus, the name Jesus means Jehovah as salvation. Hallelujah. Got news for you. When you talk about Jesus, preach about Jesus, sing about Jesus, you are singing, preaching, and talking about Jehovah. Hallelujah. You're preaching and singing and talking about Jesus, uh, Jehovah as Savior. Hallelujah. Jehovah has become our Savior. That's what the very name Jesus means. 
You want to know who Jesus is? The Lord said, search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Then you go to Luke 24, then opened he their understanding that they might understand what the scriptures and what happened as he's carried up into heaven. Verse 52, and they worshiped him. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, search the scriptures. You'll find out who he is. When you find out who he is and God opens your understanding and you suddenly understand understand the scriptures, you'll be worshiping him too. Hallelujah. You'll be in a good old fashioned Jesus name church like this one that celebrates the name of Jesus. God's revealed name to the world. But not a name that he simply spoke. Listen to me. But a name that he lived. He didn't just say, here's a name to use. He said, no, no, no. I'm going to be exactly what this name alludes to. Jehovah, your Savior. I'm going to be God in the flesh. The Word of God said, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness, have mercy. It couldn't be done. Death couldn't hold him. Death couldn't keep him. Why? Because of powers he had? No, because of who he was and who he is today. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. How be it, the Apostle Paul writes, we speak wisdom among you, excuse me, among them that are perfect, meaning mature or grown, developed, Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Paul said there's a reason why God kept the details of his plan in a rather mysterious form. There's a reason why he didn't just lay it out super duper duper plain. He said because if he'd have made it too plain, they'd have never crucified Jesus. And the whole plan was that he go to the cross. It was imperative that he go to the cross. You'll notice the Lord did not open their understanding so that they would understand the scriptures until when? Till after he rose from the dead, till he was about to ascend. Hallelujah. He waited. So that tells you a lot of what you read in the New Testament writing, a lot of their observations, a lot of the way they looked at things and saw things up until the ascension was based at that time on a very carnal understanding, a very carnal way of seeing things. So that's fine, because that's what they saw. I mean, that's how they saw it at that time. But after he ascended, all of a sudden now, when we read the epistles, we're reading all about the divinity of Christ, and we're reading all about his identity, and we're understanding better who he was. And we've got the Apostle Paul telling us, you know, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles. And what's the last thing on the list? Received up in the glory. Oh, hallelujah. Received up in the glory. That's that Jesus they were worshiping. But Paul said that was God. Mm -hmm. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. It couldn't be done. He couldn't be kept in the grave. Why? Because of who he was. John chapter 10, 17 and 18. I'm going to try and keep this short today because it is a holiday. People want to be with their families. They want to eat and do what they do, visit. So I'm trying to keep it succinct today. 
John 10, 17 and 18. Therefore doth my Father love me, because, listen, I laid down my life. He said, he didn't say somebody's going to take it from me. He said, I laid down my life. You couldn't kill me if you wanted to. In order for them to, the Romans to be able to crucify him, he had to lay his life out. He had to literally allow it to happen. But listen, he said, because I laid down my life, listen, that I might take it again. <laughs> oh my God, I want to shout. I love this holiday. I love this time of year. He didn't say, so the Father can give it back to me. Oh, so that Daddy can come to my rescue and cause me to live again. No, no, no. He said, honey, I got to lay it down. He said, but I'm going to take it right back up again. That's why my body's going to stay good, because I'm going to need it three days later. Hallelujah. Yeah. Woo. See, Tommy, I know a little Jehovah's Witness boy I met about 21 years ago, and there was a time when he said, How in the world can Jesus be God? <laughs> Do you see it? Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. He said, Because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. Listen, verse 18, John 10. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. Glory to God. I don't need somebody to come to my rescue. I don't need somebody to show up so that I can live again. No, 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 no. I can lay it down. I can take it up at will. Why? Because of who I am. And that's why it couldn't be done. That's why you couldn't keep me in the grave because I had the power to lay it down and I had the power to take it up again. Lastly today, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Oh, what? You mean the Father didn't take the Son and make him of no reputation? No. Made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. What? You mean the Father didn't make him into the form of a servant? No. He took upon himself the form of a servant. Am I telling the truth today? Yep. Yep. And was made in the likeness likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross <laughs> trying to keep it short today and done fair to Midland. Not, not perfect, but fair to Midland. The Apostle Peter said on the day of Pentecost, it was not possible that death should hold him. Hallelujah. Said it wasn't possible. Hallelujah. Why? Oh, I can tell you why in a nutshell. Because that man, Jesus, was so much more than a man. Hallelujah. That man, Jesus, was the divine one. He was the Almighty God, the everlasting Father, wrapped in human form so that He could go to the cross and He could offer that human life, He could offer that body as a sacrifice on the cross. But you know, you can kill the body, but you can't kill the soul. Amen. And the word of God said, Thou shalt not leave 
my soul in hell. Hallelujah. Got news for you, honey. That soul, that was God. Glory to God. God himself, oh my Lord, descended into the deep. Who glory descended into the pits of hell to lead captivity captive. Hallelujah. To let his Old Testament believers and saints know I've kept my promise that I told David. David, are you over there? Is that you, David? Come here, David. You remember I said to you after the fruit of your loom, uh, the fruit of your loins, I would sit on your throne. Well, honey, the fruit of your loins is up there in a tomb at the moment. That's the fruit of your loins right there. And that's going to sit in your throne forever. Hallelujah. Because I'm about to go reclaim it and walk up out of this tomb. Glory to God. And then one day I'm going to transform that body into something that is going to resemble my true personage and my true nature. Hallelujah. And you will see me as I am. And you will know that I am God. And one day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, it couldn't be done. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory.